Why is that? Yes, just awesome. Yeah, awesome projector. Oh, yeah, this thing, yeah. yeah. I like what it's doing. It's beautiful. Yeah. 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 Toilets are way out the way you came again and down the hall. Yeah. Um, in terms of, I'd just like to say thank you to our sponsors as well. So Cortex Logic and Equinox events um, are sponsoring tonight's event. So I'm sure you all agree this is a pretty awesome venue. Uh, so we're very lucky to have it. So um, and we are we are actually looking for further sponsorship as well, um, just to keep this thing going. Um, so if you are interested. Come and talk to myself or either Jacques afterwards. Um, another thing, um, we're also looking, f just looking forward to the meetups going ahead. We, you know, this is a community for us, so we, I'm looking for people to to contribute uh, for the next sessions going forward. I have a few ideas of my own, but um, obviously, I'd like I'd like the community to get involved, and so I, if there's. Problems maybe that you're facing at work, and maybe there's a solution that's out there. You know, or you've come up with an interesting way of solving a problem. You would like to share it with the group, I and mean, that would be great. Um, so, there's also if you haven't already signed up at the, on the website, there's um, there's a Slack channel available, so you can communicate with everybody via Slack. 
and uh, get involved. So that's, that's exactly what we want. Um, so without further ado, to tonight's festivities. Um, our first speaker is Jacques. Um, I, I had the privilege of meeting Jacques about six months ago when I was down in Cape Town. Um, and I think it goes without saying for both speakers tonight, both of these, these speakers are not just talking about the AI machine intelligence hype, they're actually doing it. And, uh, and, and they are hopefully going to give us some very practical tips on how we're going to get around this, this, this crazy you know, hype topic that's going on here at the moment. Um, so without further ado, um, John. Thanks, thanks Paul. Appreciate it. Okay, um, first of all, yeah, just from my side, welcome. Um, I know, I think on the Meetup, as one of the channels we've got, I think it's about 50 people that signed up, so it might be still, I'm not sure how many people are here, but I think it's probably fairly close to that, but it might be some other people as well, which is, which is awesome. Um, uh, so what we'd like to do today, this is our first Meetup here in Gauteng, so which, uh, which is awesome. So we had a, a few Meetups, in uh, Cape Town, a few events, um, and uh, it's been pretty successful and, and fantastic contributions as well. So if you want to actually see some of the stuff, you can go onto the Machine Intelligence Africa website, and on the events, we actually try and capture even these, these videos, like tonight, we've got actually a video here as well, um, but all the presentations are shared as well. So. Um, we try to do that, and we try to, if there's interesting stories, as Paul alluded to, then you're most welcome to share this. This is for us. It's not, yeah, you know, we've got a few people helping to organize things, but we're looking for uh, people out there that want to contribute and, and so forth. Now, we're going to have an AI data science hackathon. Um, I'll also quickly speak about it shortly as well, in June, in the 10th, 10th of June. And we're looking at uh, IBM South Africa actually to, to sponsor, it's one of the sponsors. Who's, is IBM here? IBM representatives? They are supposed to come as well, so that anyway, so, so that's one of the, the guys that's supposed to be here. Um, actually today we will be talking about that. So let's just fire away straight away. So what, what is on the agenda? So today uh, the topic is deep learning. So we're going to talk a bit about that. I'm going to share very specific examples, deep learning examples. Um, and we actually have a, uh, that's our, uh, our agenda for the day. So before I get to deep learning, because there's a lot of new faces here. So when we do this in Cape Town, we see a lot of familiar faces and new people and uh, familiar faces. So we, we, uh, we don't need to go through the proper introduction. So I just want to quickly introduce what this is about, what we are doing. Um, and then we're going to head off straight away into the, the, the specific topics um, as well. So today, this is the agenda. I'll be talking a bit about deep learning, and, and I will actually show some applications. And then Rukas, he's sitting right there. He's going to um, let me introduce him as, as well. He's a senior data scientist as well, and we've got it there at OLSPS Analytics. Um, and he's got an M engineering, computer engineering. Um, and uh, he's, he was actually recently at IBM's Interconnect Conference in Las Vegas. So he's going to give some honest feedback. <laughs> um, and uh, we can have a, a bit of a discussion on that. I'm also going to actually demonstrate a virtual assistant called Benedict AI um, as well, just a little bit to give you a flavor. And that's also built on our IBM Watson, or at least using some of the APIs there. So, so that should be interesting. And then the last thing would be on uh, a demonstration of a state-of-the-art AI conversational system. Now, this is actually kind of a, a rules-based system, and, and I think it's kind of when you look at deep learning and the end-to-end -end chat systems that you can create these days, it's kind of the opposite. But the, the results of this is imp so impressive, and I think it's worthwhile to look at. Um, and I think going forward, one needs to think about how do you, uh, uh, the deep learning stuff, you learn from data, but you want to contextualize it, you want to make sure you, you build in knowledge. How do you represent knowledge? That's a big thing still. So we, we will be talking a bit about that. So. Without uh, further ado, so this is the, the MIA community. We've, we've got over a thousand registrations across the MIA channels, um, which obviously represents, it's not, it's not a thousand people, but it's close. It's, it's getting about, I would say, 800 um, unique um, registrations. Uh, there's a bunch of sponsors that you can see there uh, below as well. We're looking for partners. And, and basically, just quickly, MIA is, what, what is this about? It's an innovative com com uh, community 
an accelerator for machine intelligence or AI, machine learning and data science. And we're looking at any research and applications. Now we've, we've got people from the private sector and also the public sector here, uh, universities as well. Uh, you, you talked about civic projects, for instance. Now on here, you can actually launch and register projects as well. And we can look for sponsors as well, and we can look at people that can collaborate. So that's why the Slack channel is, is there as well. Um, and I follow this, this is, so basically if you look at the, the MIA website, you will see projects, research, and all the applications. Obviously, there's a lot of focus on events, so we're trying to do a lot more events and give this, we're getting more sponsors, and we're looking at conferences, and we're looking at collaborating with other events, like, say, Deep Learning in Dava, or, or any, any of the other ones that's, that's there. Um, oh, welcome, come through. Yeah, that's, that's good. Um, so, on the website, there, there's another interesting flavor here. We talk about data science and AI and talk about applications, but you will see also there's a strong focus on how can we use these smart technologies to help transform Africa. Um, and, 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 that's, and that's why you, you will actually see on the MIA, look at the community, we've got a, a bunch of people also from other countries. And earlier this year, we actually collaborated with Data Science Nigeria. And Data Science Nigeria is sponsored by NTN in Nigeria. And we've, we actually had a panel, expert panel, data science panel from MIA that was participating in a boot camp and was, was actually um, helping and guiding them and answering questions and, and stuff like that. It was awesome. There was something like 150, how many, there was a bunch of uh, data scientists on their side as well, which is just awesome. All the questions coming through. Um, so we love that. And there's, there's quite a bit of interest from other countries as well. So we want to actually have these kind of meetups across Africa, so that's a broader vision. But if you think about Africa, there's a bunch of problems here. And um, poor education, skills, and poor health care, lack of employment, all of those type of things. And what needs is to think about how can we use smart technology to make a difference there as well. And if you look at the projects page, you will actually see some projects as examples of, of things that one can do uh, uh, as well. So just wanted to mention that. And I think I just also just had this slide up, not going to go into details here, but, but really I think what we also try to do and encourage is a smart technology empowered educational entrepreneurship ecosystem to transform Africa. We need more entrepreneurs, we need more people that skilled in smart technologies, that's why we've got Machine Intelligence Institute of Africa here to help facilitate at least that. Um, but there's a bunch of other things that's super important. The online education, we need access to affordable uh, for affordable access to the digital world, all those type of things. I've got, a, there's a few other ideas in terms of smart technology center of excellence, CUEs, um, but we can maybe discuss that at a, at a different time. And this is just showing the, the activities and growth path of, of uh, MIA over the last, we really from May last year, so uh, less than a year actually, if you think about it, although we founded it uh, slightly earlier. Um, but you can see some of the sponsors, we've got even the stuff done with the West Cape government, but Silicon Cape and, and City and Barclays Rise, and this is Barclays Equinox events. But there's, there's a bunch of other um, sponsors as well. And everything that you see in orange is, is, is the MIA activities. There were some other ones that's peripheral to this, where we participate. And there's some upcoming ones as well in Cape Town, how AI is affecting uh, the industries as well. So that's what comes through. Um, so, yeah, so all of this is on the Machine Intelligence Africa events page as well, so you can have a look at that. This year we're looking at a bunch of stuff, we talked about the data science hackathon, so just um, you will see more communication about that, uh, not by only email or on the meetup, but also on the website and also on the Slack channel. And if you want to join this, this, uh, the Slack channel, all you need to do is just send your email address to info at uh, machine intelligence Africa report. We'll list, you can go to contacts and just send it, and they will add you to it. The reason why we can't just do it automatically is, is some people sign up on Meetup and we don't know what your email address is. So, unless you sign on, on the website with your LinkedIn profile, we do have your email address, so then we can put you on. Uh, but uh, but it's, I think it's best practices just to, to email us. Um, and and I, I just want to say this is the new world that we live in now. Um, when, when I started my, my first AI company that I sold to General Electric, we wrote everything from scratch, C++, all the machine learning libraries and everything. 
It's a different world that we live in now. We've got the, the, made the big AI tech, uh, the big tech giants all vying for the AI throne. They're trying to, um, they, they're trying to create ecosystems around their analytics and deep learning and machine learning platforms like Google and even Facebook and so forth. You get IBM that's embracing it. They don't have their own one, but they're embracing it. Microsoft's um, CTK, etc. Um, Amazon, um, uh, MXNet, uh, they've selected that as there, but they also support all the other platforms. But all of that, all of that is pretty much based on open source, so they actually make it available. So, so all that open source, open source technologies are are really um, of, of importance. And that's why today um, there's actually a few demos that's built on TensorFlow using Google's TensorFlow and, and IBM Watson. So those are the two things today. Okay, so I just wanted to lead it in. We, we've got some. Not everybody is is um, is an AI expert. Now I'm just going to, or at least working. So I want to know who knows who, who writes in Python. Who knows Python? Okay. So people that didn't. So it's obviously you get people that's looking at applications and building businesses around this and doing research and stuff. That's why we've got that's that's the mere community. Um, so. Um, um, and uh, that's why what we try to cater with this particular today is to give you a kind of a high sense, just high level talk. We're not going to go into too much detail. I actually had Jupyter Notebooks ready here to show some stuff on that. But we've, we've taken it out. We also don't want to make it too long. But we've got some nice demonstrations and stuff. Looking forward to Rikas' one as well. Yeah, sorry, can we maybe yes. just expand that good idea of the audience? Yes. Um, yeah. uh, who would say they who's in business intelligence? Anybody? Yeah. Uh, predictive, predictive analytics. Predictive analytics. Yeah. Cognitive computing. Anybody touched Watson? Well, I know. You okay. guys, guys, for you guys. Management. Entrepreneurs. <laughs> Who the hell are <laughs> you? <laughs> <laughs> there's a bunch of entrepreneurs there. I know. That is um, as well. So that, that's okay. Okay. Right. So it's a mystery crowd. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, so what I'm going to do, let's fire away here. So, um, who heard about the fourth industrial revolution? Okay, a few. I, I, my, other, my other term for this is the smart technology era. Um, because if you think about industrial, it thinks oh, it's just it's, it's like the, the industrial, it's more industrial, but, but this is affecting everything, all sectors, uh, financial services, everything. Um, so, that's why I call it the smart technology era. And, and I think the critical thing here is just to realize that we, we do stand on the brink of the technology revolution that will fundamentally alter the way we live, work, and relate to one another. Um, and we can already sense that, but just the, 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 the quick changes that's happening. Now, the interesting thing is, um, I think as humans, we just look at linear, everything is linear. You can't really visualize um, exponential. We don't, because this, we live in time, so it's just, it just feels linear. So it's, and, and there's another thing, I think humans also deal, it's difficult for humans to deal with probabilities as well, uh, as well. So it's a few things like that. Um, but we are in a very interesting time, period. And, and what we have down here is just, we obviously know we're in a digital revolution. But what's happening now is there's a fusion of new technologies, and in the next few slides I'm actually showing that, that's blurring the lines between what's physical, what's digital, and even what's biological. So this is where it gets super interesting. Um, with biotech and everything. And, and I think what we're seeing is that you see AI and genomics and biotech and all sorts of, you see applications and, 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 and it feeds off one another. And basically what's happening, it's impacting all disciplines, economies, industries. I've got one slide on AI machine learning landscape where you can actually see that. And what's the big driver uh, behind this kind of AI? It is actually deep learning. Deep learning made a massive difference um, um, when, when we started really with proper uh, cloud computing, enough data, and obviously improvements in the algorithms and the architectures, and, and it's feeling, and there's a lot of money being pumped into this. You know, but Elon Musk uh, and, and other guys has invested in open AI a billion dollars over time, and you see obviously the Googles and IBMs and all these companies uh, uh, investing quite a bit of money into so if you think about the fourth industrial revolution, you see the velocity, the scope, and the system's impact. Um, and this is just this slide is just emphasizing that, um, what I've just uh, talked about. And just quickly, in terms of AI uh, and deep learning specifically applications, you see, if you look at self-driving cars, what's happening in the US, 
Um, there's a bunch of deep learning that sits behind that, um, especially around image recognition and, and so forth. But uh, also other things as well, uh, um, reinforcement learning and all sorts of things. You see AI also applied to drones, um, virtual assistants, chatbots, virtual assistants, robot advisors, all of that is, is come to the fore. Um, and, and all of this is driven by exponential increases in computing power and availability of vast amounts of, of data as well. And this, I just wanted to show this slide as well. So on this particular slide, what you see here is, is really that exponential curve. And it's also the fusion of these technologies. So you can't probably see it at the back there, but on the left-hand side, the bottom here, the exponential tech, some of them are listed. Um, there's others, there's even blockchain, those type of technologies that's, that's got, that will have a major impact. And you will see interesting stuff going forward as well, even around uh, blockchain and stuff. When, people, when they talk about decentralized autonomous organizations and AI decentralized autonomous organizations. So it's basically, you've got AI driving the smart contracts on, on blockchain and stuff. So it's, it's, it's everywhere. You see the fusion happening everywhere. Um, so, and, and again, this, this slide is just emphasizing the unlimited opportunities with mobile and exponential technologies um, that I've already mentioned. So this is the, the landscape. Uh, I don't know who has seen this slide before. Um, there's a few, this, this is originally from Bloomberg Beta, and they've created two other ones. This is in a 2015, but I like this one because it actually shows, um, obviously there's core technologies, so like AI, deep learning, machine learning, and I've got a slide that actually positioned that where that all fits in. But, but the, the key thing here is rethinking enterprise. So basically, if you look at any corporate, any enterprise, all aspects of your enterprise will be disrupted. So it's not even the, just the industries. Obviously, you're saying rethinking industries there. And even the rethinking human-computer um, interfaces as well. Clearly, with virtual assistants, and I don't know if you've seen um, also Echo Show, um, Amazon's Echo Show, it's not just the, like Google Home, the device that sits there. It's got a screen. There's some, you can look at in YouTube some of the demos that's going out now, and it's pretty impressive, very, very effective. You've got the visual thing with the intelligent system or at least a uh, chatbot uh, as well. Uh, but the bottom line is you can see uh, everything being affected. So enterprise, you see sales, security, fraud detection, HR, marketing, uh, etc. But now if you look at even machine intelligence landscape 2.0, you'll see there's a bunch of stuff just focused on agents. A on the agents, you see the chatbots, the virtual, um, the, 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 the intelligent virtual assistants and robot advisors, and you will obviously see the operating system interfaces that's utilizing this. And then autonomous systems, you know, drones, we used to talk about air, ground, sea, all of that. But again, the same as before. And it's just getting more crowded. This is now the latest version, um, where now it's focused on enterprise intelligence and enterprise the functions we talked about before, but again, some of the other things listed. And on the right hand side, you will see a technology stack that's kind of maturing, um, which is super interesting. And you get all these little um, logos here, it's all companies that's really trying to position themselves and focus on individual aspects of this. So, very interesting. All right, so now I'm going to go into applications and I'm going to show a demo something and then we're going to go to, to um, Rikas. So, so, what is artificial intelligence machine learning? Um, by the way, the deep, is it, uh, on LinkedIn, I've posted uh, kind of a, a deep learning applications post that when we talk a bit more about this and show, kind of show more of the applications, also talks about the limitations of deep learning, what's next, and, and all of that. So if you're interested, you can, have, you can read, read that. Um, it's also talking about the platforms and, and what, who is the winning platforms. And so it's, very, it's quite an interesting read if you're interested in the technical aspects. But okay, what, what is AI? So, so AI is really uh, a branch of computer science. Uh, so computer science needs to claim it, I think. <laughs> um, that develops machines and software with intelligence. Well, that's the simplest definition. So what is machine learning? You get, I don't know who read the book, The Master Algorithm. Okay, so that's something for you if you're interested. You, that, well, a lot of you are interested in AI, so I would recommend reading that as well. Uh, Peter Domingos, Professor Peter Domingos. Um, and in that book, uh, he talks about the five tribes, and uh, machine learning or connectionism is one of the tribes. Um, there's also Bayesianism and, and symbolism and 
all, all the other tribes as well. So machine learning is one of them. Machine learning is focused on, it's obviously a branch of AI, but it's, it's really focused on systems that can learn from data. So you don't program it. It's not like a program where you write. Maybe you've got a program that implements the neural network, but you don't tell it what to do. To do. You feed it data, similar to us humans. You feed, we feed we're bombarded with all sorts of sense information. Everything's like a video. Everything's in time. Um, and we are working with this information. We are forming concepts and constructs. And, and we can talk and we, can, we put languages and all sorts of different things. Now, machine learning is, is really trying to emulate that in a simple way um, as well. Now, deep learning is a breakthrough because it's, it's more sophisticated. It's, it's, um, it's focusing on higher levels. So basically, you've got, you've got just go a lot deeper because you can. We've got the cloud computing. We've got the data. That's how thing. Very data hungry. And you've got a bunch of very innovative architectures that emulates even the visual cortex in the brain. V1, if you, if you just think about, you see something in your retina, you go to LNS, you go to V1, V2, then you go to the inferior, to the IT area, and then it goes to the frontal cortex. And, but, but basically what it does is to form higher forms of abstraction. So the, the V1 areas will look at edges and stuff, and then when you go later on, you will actually look at putting a face together and recognize it, and then it passes it on. So it's, it, it, it works like this. So deep learning is, uh, in a certain sense, uh, based on, 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 on how the brain works. Um, so, so why deep learning is suddenly changing your, your life? So um, this is a, sorry, I've got the things a bit that way around, but this is just kind of recognizing, it's a very simple example, showing a wolf in red there, and you've got, okay, and a dog. And you recognize a particular picture here. Uh, so you've got a bunch of, basically how it works, you've got a bunch of training examples uh, during the training phase, and you're going to fit thousands of labeled images. And then the input, input is this unlabeled image that shows a pre-trained network. So obviously, you say you've got a trained network, then it goes through this. And basically on this level, it's just detecting edges, um, looking at different shapes, and all sorts of things. And then you feed that, and it's actually composing more complex structures. And it does it on its own, because it's training. And basically how a neural network works is, you, um, you've got between all these neurons, you've got connections that learn, and the way it learns, is you actually need to feed back the error from the output. So if you feed forward and you make a mistake, you say it's not a dog, it's a, let's say you say actually that's a wolf, um, then it will penalize all the weights. Every, every weight's contribution to the error will be penalized. And you need, you need an algorithm to do that. And that's what backpropagation is doing. So backpropagation is incredible power. We call it error backpropagation. So it proper backpropagates the error and do credit assignment and figuring out how to change each of these weights. So it's interesting with the brain also, because lots of association, that's a, that's a different story, but, but it's uh, um, that in principle on a high level is how it works. And, and this is just showing it. So you've, we've got a bunch of, hi, welcome. No problem. Thank you. Hi, beam is here. You can sit there. <coughs> okay, so we're going to get to i shortly. Um, so, this is an example of a convolutional neural network um, where you feed it images and, and basically the, what, what we talked about, this is the actual edges being discovered by this convolutional, you can see that convolutional layer there. Um, and, and another one here, you can see it started detecting nose and eyes and the ears started recognizing faces. Um, and then it, you feed it to a, a fully connected network um, and then you can start doing classifications as well. Um, so this is just examples where Google is using TensorFlow. They're using it everywhere. Uh, there's actually another presentation here that shows how many projects? It will look like thousands of projects um, where they just use this. So it's everywhere. Um, but, but you can see search, advertising, their biggest form of revenue, um, speech recognition, photos, maps, street views. So thank, thank, thank deep learning also, TensorFlow. This is probably one of their best apps. I will uh, um, Google, I'm going to get it for free. Street View, Translate, YouTube, um, I'm using a bunch of that. Now what's interesting here is, um, it's not just the visual thing. So obviously you can do visual object recognition. You can position things that are close enough to, uh, close enough to one another, position them together. But you can actually now take words and have a, a, represent a mathematical representation in 
um, in-dimensional space. And then what it does, just by going through documents, re reading documents, it's figuring out a man and a woman is connected in some way. An uncle and aunt is connected. A king and a queen is connected. Uh, or kings and king, and so forth. And you can actually manipulate these concepts and words, uh, which, which is awesome. Uh, the well-known one from a few years ago was this, obviously, um, on YouTube where um, Google, Google Brain, I think it was Google Brain, that launched, uh, uh, that detected cats automatically unlabeled from YouTube videos and stuff. But object recognition is about just detecting whatever it is. But what's really cool is, I know Microsoft has done some really good breakthroughs initially with machine translation as well, but, but everybody's using deep learning stuff. But you, you, you really feed this, the quick brown fox jumped over there and then translates, I think that's French. What, what is that? French. Looks, looks like French. Um, but now what's interesting, you get these kind of examples that actually can generate image captions. And basically what it does is a combination of a convolutional neural network that does the, the, the image recognition to detect what are the things in this picture. And then based on that, what it does is to actually use a recurrent neural network to generate a sequence of words based on the concepts that, that it's actually seen. So, so that's why if you run this, you see sometimes different image captions for the same thing because you can generate it. And it learns that. So you, the, a recurrent neural network remembers the previous state. So it remembers, it builds me to say, it knows, I've actually said like, this word, it, it, it looks at sequences. It, it's, it, you learn sequences. Um, so in this case, a man holding a tennis racket on a tennis court, that's what the deep learning system produces. So it's a combination of systems. Two pictures sitting on top of a stove, top stove, often a group of young people playing a game of frisbees. And this one's more difficult, a man flying through the air while riding a, a, a snowboard. So this is where it gets creative. It looks like snow it looks like it. it's trying to figure it out. And and uh, so okay, now so if we just generalize now, wh where is this all applicable? Um, so obviously anything to do with sound, any time series there, you can apply recurrent neural nets as well. Text, we can deal with text, you can even use convolutional neural networks for text, images, video, so any of those type of things. And this is very much part of the unstructured data. If you think about plants, if you think about the real world out there, and we've got lot, most of the stuff is being produced like that. Now you've got systems that can actually learn and, and, and recognize stuff. You can automate systems just based on all of this. So it's basically identifying patterns in unstructured data, which most people know as media, such as images, sound, voice, and text. And on the right hand side, you see the industries where this is relevant. And it's quite interesting um, to look at this. I'll make the slides available so afterwards as well. So it will be on the events uh, page as well. We'll I'll also update the LinkedIn posts uh, that, that advertise this uh, meetup. All right, so let's look at some practical applications. So, so this, what, this is what uh, banks or, or you know, yeah, banks were saying, what are the reasons for using AI-powered solutions by, oh, I should say, financial services, just banks and insurance industries and so forth. Now, obviously, you want to improve your ability to, com uh, to compete with your peers and stuff, but it was quite interesting. They want to increase workforce productivity. And if you think about even what Ivan Watson is, if Ivan is very much behind this, how can we uh, enhance the user experience and empower them um, as well? And Rick is going to talk more about the whole theme around that. So clearly, we want to do that. But increase our standing as an innovative company, identify uh, opportunities in data that would otherwise be missed. These are some of the, in the next five years, some of the applications and anti-money laundering, just to detect that um, in one area. Uh, chatbots, and it's not just chatbots, it's virtual assistants because it's a growth path, it's like, like a roadmap, and robo advisors. Algorithmic trading, you already know, you see, you've seen this. The world's biggest hedge fund, um, Bridgewater Associates, I think it's got $150 billion under assets under management. They're using artificial intelligence for their hedge fund automatic stuff all the time. So this stuff is happening. Fraud detection is another one, customer recommendations, there's plenty others as well. And this is what Andrew Inch has said, um, well he's not anymore the chief scientist of Baidu, uh, but he used to be. Just as electricity 100 years ago transformed industry after industry after industry, I think AI powered by deep learning will now do the same. Powerful statement, <coughs> but that's the potential here. So it's important to get into the system. In, in, uh, and start using these kind of tools. Now I'm going to a few applications before I demo and show you some stuff. Um, 
Uh, this is just um, Google DeepMind. <coughs> we did acquire DeepMind a few years ago, and this is an example where they um, scan a million eyes to fight blindness uh, with their, this in the UK, their national health system, um, or services, national health services. Um, so it's great to see. It's not just, because some of their initial applications was to actually optimize Google's data centers. And now they're moving into healthcare applications as well. How can we make a difference on that front? Um, Okay, we talk about Ivy Watson as well. So Ivy Watson has done some good work on uh, on medicine and healthcare specifically. Here is an example where it recommends treatment as doctors in 99% of cancer cases. And there was examples in Japan where they couldn't pick it up the problem um, and or fast enough, and, and they I think they they, they detected uh, the, the the problem. And Enriquez, do you know about the Japan use case? Okay. Uh, Okay, then lots of other examples. I just highlighted crop yield prediction. So in the US, um, it was around the uh, county level soybean production in the US, so they're using uh, deep learning kind of systems to, to do those type of things as well. So I'm just going to list some inspiration applications. I have actually on the, in the deep mind, uh, deep learning post, there's a bunch of applications I've listed there. I don't have time to go through, but this is just to give you a sense. Um, so this is kind of high level. There's, there's a lot of scientific applications. I've listed some of them in the in, the, in the, the LinkedIn post as well. Um, so the first one is just colorization of black and white images. So you can take your black and white photos. Obviously, this system is trained. And then you can, uh, there's APIs available as well. And it will just color it in. So you can see that's the black and white. And there's the colorization, black and white colorization. And it's amazing when it comes up with the right colors. It doesn't come up with. Uh, so obviously, it's trained on photos and data, and remember and these type of things, you train it, and then you look at the system to generalize an unseen data, to actually produce these kind of correct, um, so it's been, been trained to actually do it properly. Um, and now as we look at this, she's playing the flute there, and it's filling it the right colors. Okay, that's a, a picture of me, <laughs> I've just wanted to look at the, if I can do it right, I'm not sure if it's high right, but anyway, it was a few years ago. All right, I'm going to show this one. This is actually interesting. Uh, automatically adding sounds to silent movies, um, which is cool. It'll think about old movies that don't have sound, but now we can add sound to that. Um, and I'm going to actually quickly play this as well, so I'll get to this one shortly. Um, then uh, something like where, just think about your, your, even if you take your cell phone, you look at something, you say in the country, you don't understand the language, more chocolate, then you can get a deep learning system that will actually just change it to dark chocolate for you and you can see what it is. So it does that translation and stuff, which is super cool. All done with deep learning. Um, object classification, detection, photograph, okay, we've seen this. So, but, but you can see, okay, so you can't probably see this properly, but, but it comes up with a number of suggestions and then the one with the, 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 the highest likelihood obviously is gonna show that. Um, so here's an example of uh, where it detects hat with the white brim, and this is a dog, so you can do all that. And what's cool now, if you still, I don't know who still writes a lot, but uh, it's getting very good with automatic uh, handwritten generation. So you can actually do that as well. It can actually generate things as well. Well, this is interesting. So you can actually generate based on um, your certain handwriting. You can actually, you, you show basically what this thing does. You can, you can type something in, uh, and then it will generate in handwriting mode. So generate handwriting as opposed to just recognizing. This is actually a hand, handwriting generation. And what's really cool, if um, these examples, I've got examples where it actually you train it on, say, Shakespeare, or you train it on a certain style, and then, especially with the current neural networks, then it starts to learn the style, and it can actually generate. Then everything might make sense, but it's amazing what it comes up with. Very creative stuff, um, and it generates that. And you can even do this with programming languages where it learns, the, say Python, it learns Python. Just based on lots of Python programs. It learns the structure, it even learns the comments. It comes up with its own comments and stuff like that as well. And it's, it's amazing, it's amazing to see some of the examples. Okay, we've, we've shown the uh, automatic image capture generation. And then uh, DeepMind specifically, their fame was, was around Atari games where they've used reinforcement learning Reinforcement learning is slightly different to uh, supervised learning where you actually give it the exact output. This is, a, this is what it is, this is the label. 
Now, if we're reinforcement learning, it works in a reward penalty system. So all you feed it, you've got objective function, and the objective function it is increasing, and you know I'm moving in the right direction. If it's not, it's obviously it's a problem. So with gauge, you've got scores. So basically what you feed, you just feed it these pixels, and see, this is what you can manipulate, and uh, learn the game. And I've got an example of where you can see how it, it's just amazing. It, it, it can generalize across games as well. Um, and actually, I've trained the systems, one of the quick demos here. Um, it, uh, it took a, a full day to get it to actually, um, I don't know who knows Flappy Bird, when a bird that goes through it. So I've, I've trained a, a, a deep, a, a, well, obviously using reinforcement learning and so forth, but um, and it was struggling initially. And, and you can see how it gives rewards and penalties and so forth. But then suddenly it got it right, gets through it, starts to learn it. So I'm going to quickly play that now. As a matter of fact, that's the next one. Um, so here it goes. So what you see on the right hand side is uh, I'm running this, um, uh, it was just a Python file, uh, DQ network Python, and it's Flappy Bird. And on the left hand side, you can see this little bird trying to, to do stuff. This is actually after a full day, just on this machine. So I didn't run it in the cloud or anything. Got a GPU stuff, but it's, um, so, so here it goes. Um, it's trying. Oops, it's like, it's still dumb after a day. <laughs> <laughs> but it's getting there. Look at this. Just made it. Yeah. <laughs> then it goes through the system. And it's, and if it touches it, so then obviously it's not so. Uh, problem. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so that's how it learns. <coughs> you don't put anything else, it's just reward penalty system using a deep learning system. I mean, you just feed a lot of these kind of stuff. And, and I think we underestimate, we as humans, okay, we, we don't, we're not awake 24 hours, but eight, 10 hours a day, every day, our brain's being trained. We small, we, we actually see a lot of data over, over, over time. And we think, so, so one shouldn't underestimate how much data we actually get. And into a system with 10 to the power of 11 neurons, and every neuron potentially connected to 10,000 other neurons. So we haven't got systems yet that we simulate on a computer that's that large. We've got lots of data now, but we can we will get there soon. And we get creating hardware as well. Okay, so I'm gonna stop you. There's some other ones there. I want to show you just a few things. I'm gonna do a bit more demos here very quickly, and then I'm gonna head over to Rikas. Um, and uh, so let's let's go. So let's uh, go to here. So the, the first one I want to show is that, that sound one that I talked about. So I'm just going to play it a little bit. Um, I'll put it in. Pills um. make distinctive sounds when you hit and scratch them. These sounds can tell us how objects behave when we physically interact with them. They can convey whether an object is hard or soft, smooth or rough, and rigid or deformable. In this work, we consider the material understanding task of predicting what sounds will be made when you hit it. We give an algorithm a silent video of someone striking things with a drumstick. We ask it to produce a plausible soundtrack to go along with it. To perform this task well, the algorithm has to recognize the materials that are being hit and the actions that are being performed, but we don't explicitly tell it about these things. Instead, it has to learn about them by recognizing patterns in the raw audiovisual signal. Our algorithm takes a video sequence as input and it predicts a corresponding sequence of sound features. After our network predicts sound features, we synthesize a waveform by matching these features to a database of impact sounds and transferring best matches. Here are some soundtracks that our algorithm produced. Pretty good. Timing is also good. Ground. To help understand what our model is doing, we can look at the video clips in our database that it's transferring audio from. These are the audio clips whose sound features are most similar to those predicted by our model. Instead of synthesizing a waveform by transferring... Yeah, I'm going to stop it there. I just wanted to give you a sense so 
that was the one. I, I'm going to show more of that. Let's just pick stuff here. So without showing this now, I just wanted to, sh to show you this is an example of where it actually look at uh, from, I think this is a Van Gogh one, is that right? Yeah, Van Gogh's art. So it learns Van Gogh's art, Van Gogh's art. Gogh, art. And basically what it does is to say, okay, I'm looking at a picture as input. Let's create a Van, Van Gogh version of that. And then it comes up with these kind of things. So you can see on the right hand side. So it's kind of artistic and and so so that, that's just an example. Let's just see if there's well, of a me. Okay, I'll, 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 I just wanted to show that. Um, and then, okay, I'm not going to show this, but this is an example where it actually writes music uh, and Shakespeare novels, and it's using recurrent neural networks uh, as well to do that. Um, and in this, it actually shows not only that, it shows a Python example. You just see, um, it comes up with all these kind of things. It's just amazing. Um, here's another example where it's um, it, this is the content image, and then get it's the same kind of thing to the and, and it generates creative things based on that. Um, what was the last one? Okay, this is just an example. This is an example of that Atari uh, game where it, it really started figuring it out. And what's interesting when you get to, you just go after 240 minutes of training. And it was struggling, the magic happens. It realized to dig a tunnel. Um, so it started to dig a tunnel on the left hand side. And then once you've got a tunnel, then it will actually work for you in your favor. Um, there we go. Now it's just helping me. So those those are some, some of the things that they do. Um, and then the last let me just see. Okay, then if you go to Tensor uh, TensorFlow, there's a playground. If you're unfamiliar with neural networks, this is not even deep learning, but you can add hidden layers. So I can actually um, increase my hidden layers. Yeah. So this what you see is the, the the input, the data, the features, and you can increase in the layers. And what you're actually trying to do here is to, to learn a system that can separate the blue and the orange uh, from one another. So it does a classification. So there's the training happening. And basically what you see here, you will see uh, the blue and, and the orange here, which corresponds, orange corresponds to minus one and the blue to, to plus one. So it starts, and really they suddenly break through, went down the error tremendously. So this is showing the error curve. And it figured it out. And you can see the strength of the various connections, negative connections versus positive connections. So this was just an example. So it's try still to learn this, but it actually got it right. And it figured it out nonlinear, obviously, relationships here, and it figured it out. Um, so this, you want to play here, there's multiple examples here. Um, and I wanted to show this to you because this, this is the, um, so let's just make this, uh, maybe I should just play again. Uh, am I still on the network here? Let's just see. Yeah. Okay, there we go. There we go. It's fine. Okay, so. So I'm not sure this is good. Let's Anyway, this is showing convolution near the internet where you put handwritten recognition in and it actually selects, well, there we go. So let's, let's try it now. Um, so this is an example of a convolutional neural network. So the input, the input image that I'm going to draw here, it's going to appear here. And you can see the richness of the connections right through this. This is a convolutional neural network, then it's downsampling, so that's pooling. Then it does another uh, convolutional downsampling sampling again. Then it's a fully connected network, and there it will actually predict. You can't see it at the back, but zero to nine. So it's actually predicting the digit. So if I write something, let's make it more difficult. I don't know if it's difficult, something like that. Then that's the input image, and it's trying. Remember what you said initially about edges, and then com more complex shapes, and, 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 and then until you actually get to the recognizing it's that digit and stuff. So its first case, you can see the downsample drawing is five. Its first case is five. The second case is seven. So there's probabilities associated with that. Um, and I don't know if it can get that right. So this is, it actually thinks of eight. <laughs> anyway, so you can play around with this. This is just an example to visualize what it's seeing. OK, my last thing here, I'm going to show um, Bennett and AI just very, I'm not going to go through the whole demonstration. Um, I'm going to sign in here. Hopefully, the connection is good. 
This is an example of using a bunch of services as well at the back. And we're also using IBM uh, White's conversational service in this particular demonstration. Um, and you're going to talk about it now shortly thereafter. So I'm going to, so I'm logging in with my, so this is that intelligent virtual production assistant that's helping users like supervisors or uh, quality technicians or special production specialists or equipment specialists to be more productive at work. And very important in the industrial space is safety. So if there's a problem, whatever it needs to be, they want to log it, uh, for, for example. Um, but, but I think what's key, what we're working on here is actually to generate a productivity dashboard where you get a score on productivity, you get a score on engagement, and it's actually coming with lots of suggestions how can you be more productive based on all the information that you're providing. And we're also rating how you feel at work and what's happening, what are your problems and issues and stuff like that. And we do analytics on this in the back end, so from data science, that, that actually looks at patterns and things. And, and we can overlay that with the actual plant performance. So you can see how the person feels, what he's saying about the plant, and compare that with actual what's happening in the plant as well. Um, anyway, so I'm going to sign in with my uh, with Google. So I think I'm, let's see if it's quick enough. Okay, let me move slightly. Um, Okay. Hi Jacques, cool. I'm Bennett, okay. your virtual production assistant. That aims to simplify your day and use your time at work better. Thank you. Okay, so uh, this is just an early prototype. Uh, we, we actually have on my eyes, on my phones, we've got some st stuff that's beginning to look like hello, but for the production environment, and it's got suggestions and all sorts of different things and, uh, and, and graphs and stuff like that we that we built. So I'm going to just demonstrate some of the functionality. So. So let's fire it away. So I'm going to say, um, hi, uh, I did it. Hello, Jacques. I'm doing good. I'm here to help you. Just say the word. Thanks. Thanks, Jacques. It's my pleasure. OK, so I'm going to say, I'm in trouble. <laughs> Oops, sorry. And, and basically what it does is to learn intense. So Jacques, is something wrong? Yes, got a problem, man. Jacques, do you need help? Yes, for sure. <laughs> okay, Jacques, stay calm. We'll be calling 911 right now. Please describe the issue if you can. I was almost hit by a forklift. Thanks, Jacques. Much appreciated. The incident has been captured. Are there any additional information that should be recorded, no. e.g., video? Safety report. Okay. Name. Jacques. Okay. Workplace. Okay. Bennett. And, 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 Thanks, Jacques. You're and, welcome. And, 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 and if I say, ah, oh, you're funny or stupid or dumb or whatever, I'm oh, sorry, that. My apologies, well, Jacques. It, it I'll out. be better <laughs> next time. <laughs> cool. Thanks, Jacques. I'm here to support you. Okay. Uh, so, so I say I want to learn something to make specific. This thing is. Jacques, I know your name. Okay, sorry. How can I help you? Yeah. Sorry, sir. Sorry, sir. Oh, I learned something. Jacques, I understand you need some more domain-specific manufacturing information. How can I help you? I'm just going to say tire processes. You see? There are six basic processes in the manufacture of tires. Mixing of carbon blacks, elastomers, and chemicals in the Benberry mixer to form the rubber compounds. Calendaring the fabrics and steel cord, you know, and combing them with rubber, extruding the treads and side wall. Jacques, what information do you need? Okay, I'm just going to say vulcanization. What is that? I don't know what that is. Then. The rubber components of the tire <laughs> are vulcanized by steam generated heat in the mold and bladder at pressure as high as 400 psi and temperatures of approximately 200 for approximately 10. Thanks, Jacques. Okay. You're welcome. <laughs> Okay, so I'm gonna. Sorry for that. <laughs> sorry, Jacques. Let's try to avoid profanity. <laughs> anyway, so so what it does also does is start of day, end of day. So so for instance, um, so I'm so I'm leaving now. Um, so I'm leaving. I'm leaving work. Jacques, all right. Please rate your happiness at work today on a scale from one, very unhappy, to no, unhappy, happy. three. Jacques, okay. please rate production. Per so, so we actually go through this. We say, say feel all of those kind of stuff, and we actually provide suggestions. So you can just click or just speak to the thing. So there's actually a microphone here as well. This is just initially just to simulate this. But, but anyway, um, 
Uh, what it also does is it actually captures your interests and favorite colors, all sorts of stuff. And if you've got things that you're very particularly interested in, you can come up with suggestions around those type of things. Oh, you might find this interesting, those type of things as well. Um, so the, 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 the versions on the mobile phone is look a lot, it looks a lot different to this, but in terms of functionality, I think I just wanted to give you a sense of that. Okay, with that, I'm, I'm done. So I want to hand over to Rikus. You're going to give some feedback on IBM Watson, and then you're going to show a very impressive virtual assistant demo uh, as well, but it's not based on, on this type of thing. It's actually a symbolic system. So, okay, so switching to you. Mystery crowd. <laughs> um, I was at IBM to Connect a while back, um, and I thought um, IBM are in some way, some ways leading. And I thought it'd be interesting just to sort of give feedback on the direction they're taking, because that'll filter down to wherever you are, what you're doing, it'll get you eventually. So this gives you sort of a heads up of what's coming. My name is Rukas Comron. I work for a company called OLSPS Analytics, and we do predictive analytics. Um, but I'm here, I represent myself tonight. I'm not presenting, representing my company, I'm also not representing IBM. <laughs> That's what I want to say. Right, now the conference is huge. Uh, Interconnect is, is really primarily for IBM internally, as mostly IBM people and then people from IBM business partners, like my employer is. So I was there in that capacity. 4.5 days, 2,200 sessions, 25,000 people. Uh, that's just to give you an idea, that's Mandalay Bay Hotel in Las Vegas. Many people walking around, that's people eating, feeding 25,000 people without a hitch, just flowing smoothly all the time. It was just extremely nervous. All this is as good as it's not. <laughs> I, I went there specifically to find out about Watson um, and the cloud, where that's heading. And this is this is all strategic stuff. It's not details, it's big picture. There also was a lot of talk about Internet of Things, blockchain security. I sort of ignored that, just wasn't enough time. So I want to tell you, just briefly give you an idea of what IDN's vision is uh, for the cloud uh, and Watson. Um, I'll give you an idea of what the cloud platform looks like currently, and then some of my personal takeaways, and then just briefly on cloud migration. I, is there somebody whose company is trying to move to the cloud, who talks about it, for whom it's an issue? Anybody that's no, heard of the cloud? What is it? <laughs> <laughs> right, <laughs> it <doing? laughs> um, First of all, I think it's uh, CEO is Gini Rometti. Um, this is, I'm giving a summary of the keynote speech. So this is what she was trying to convey. This is in, inside Mandalay Bay Hotel. They've got a stadium inside, holds 12,000 people. So she was trying to say three things. Um, IBM's cloud offering is enterprise strong, data first, cognitive to the core. All buzzwords, I'll tell you what she meant with that. Enterprise strong, meaning IBM is big. Um, They've got 50 data centers in 19 countries. They, won, they have one here in Johannesburg now as well, opened about two months ago. Largest commercial IoT platform. It's a public cloud, but they may put very strong emphasis on the fact that they're offering it to industry. Um, they offer choice and consistency. Um, so you can choose whether you're running yourself on premises or whether you're moving to the cloud. Um, there's very fine-grained control over, uh, over uh, privacy and there's a large range of, very large range of services and applications. IBM is trying to gather everything, all the legacy software, all the new development, um, all eventually under the same uh, interface that you can access. 
this process of moving from on-premises to the cloud, moving your applications over, moving your data over, is a process. And for a long time, you're going to stand with one foot on your own premises and one foot in the cloud. And IBM recognizes that, and they make provision for what they call hybrid solutions. So a bit of everything. And that's both for data and for your applications. Uh, lots of emphasis on security, it's building from, from the bottom up, from our billion or up. And um, as I mentioned, there are a number of other technologies. Um, the idea is to bring everything in as they move. So talk about blockchain te technology, talk about quantum computing, apparently. We'll see whether that happens. Um, and the third point there that you mentioned was, um, was, was data first. So they value adding strategy, strategy. They, they specifically di differentiate from other big companies like uh, Google and Facebook, who talk a lot about d democratizing data, bringing everybody's data, making it available to everybody. I mean, says, no, we're helping you to keep your own data to yourself. We recognize it's important to you, we recognize it gives competitive edge, and we support you in that. So, um, they help with, they're aware of governance issues, so legal issues, who may see your data, may cross uh, borders of countries, may go outside the country. And there are ways to deal with it, very fine grained access control. Uh, locality, you can choose where in the world in which data centers you want your data. If it's not allowed to move over uh, country borders, then it doesn't. And inside data centers, you can, um, you know, the, your data and your applications can be isolated on machine level or if it's uh, if you're sharing machines with other people on virtual machine level. Cognitive to the core is a reference to Watson, to cognitive computing. And Watson can handle unstructured data, so different uh, media types, text, images, voice, uh, IoT sensors. There's a wide range of capabilities. Uh, so. Cognitive computing is Watson, but they're also bringing in um, legacy uh, applications that handles analytics uh, and machine and newer technology that handles machine learning. Um, part of Watson is that IBM sometimes collaborate uh, with uh, with chosen partners, universities, many times, building interesting applications, like in a lot of work in healthcare. And a side effect of that is that they're gathering uh, lots of high quality knowledge that's curated. Um, so extremely labor intensive, but that information is there. And it just grows all the time. So eventually, if you need it, then it's available to you to, if you pay for it. So that was Gini Rometti, uh, just a brief overview of where they're heading. Uh, but if we zoom out a bit, I mean, strategic overview, there were three elements there. The platform, so the, the actual software uh, and the cloud technology. The ecosystem, <coughs> they're embracing especially open source software. So there's lots of interaction, collaboration with open source partners. And then a methodology that they call the data first method, which I'll speak about. The platform consists of four main groups of applications, and, and those are linked to four roles within companies. They're targeting data engineers, business analysts, data scientists, uh, and app developers. And Data Connect is really about lots of different ways to connect to different types of databases, to ingest your own data, and I guess that you eventually have a data lake with many um, different types of data sources, but all uh, in a way that you can access uh, easily and simply from the same place. What's in analytics is a bit on the side. It's um, business, anal business analyst. It's still fairly simple. Data science experience is where almost everything is happening at the moment. Uh, that's aimed at data scientists, and that's built on almost entirely on open source software. IBM has put a layer, uh, uh, application layer, well, interface layer on top of all the open source software, like Apache Spark and Python. Uh, um, Jupyter Notebooks, um, and some of the legacy software. And the idea is that this thing will continue to grow for a long time still as they integrate legacy software, as they add new open source, and as they add some of the newer applications. Then Bluemix is, is a, a broader base. It's their cloud infrastructure. And 
and it offers as a service um, different types. So, so uh, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, software as a service. So it's a, a lot. Um, you can just if you just want hardware in the cloud, you can you can rent that. If you want uh, hardware with the operating system installed, you can rent that. If you want um, speech recognition APIs, you can access that. So on any level, um, it's all integrated in Bluemix. And those other three components are mostly built on top of Bluemix as well internally. Um, and I think that's useful. So they they very aware of those four roles as they put all of this together. And this shows that um, in the life cycle of a, of a data science problem, um, how those different roles interact. And the details are unimportant. What is important is that they are thinking about it. And they're bringing that actively into the design of this whole platform. So that data science experience platform, the valid proposition said, because it's, it's all open source, so why not just use your own open source that you download for free? And this is what they're adding. And it makes sense, especially if you're a large company, especially if you want to move fast, and especially if you have many people that have to work together on the same, plat uh, on the same problem. Uh, so system administration is easy, it's built in. Um, it's all set up to reflect current best practices, and it's updated all the time to keep abreast of that. Collaboration is easy. Uh, sharing internally as part of collaboration is easy, but also the wider community. You can publish, you can read tutorials and articles, and you can publish those as well. And Jupyter Notebooks, you can make those available. So it's all this big pool of information that's very easy to interact with. Documentation is built in. Uh, governance controls are built in, access control is built in. Um, so you can, on very fine level, decide from this bunch of data, I 